Welcome back to the program. Whenever we think of war and conflict, we think about geopolitics and weaponry and the war against terrorism. But what happens to the children who are stuck in the middle of war zones? What's the psychological effect on them? Can they ever adjust to a normal life? Joining us from Manchester is Rachel Kalem, a psychologist who specializes in kids in conflict zones. Also joining us, writer and former journalist Carl Shembri. He joins us from Amman, Jordan. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Rachel, let me start with you. Uh, as we've just heard, 15 million children in the middle of war zones right now. Uh, is there some way of them recovering psychologically from this experience, recovering their childhood and their innocence? Well, we know that, um, that of course, that, that many, many children are affected tremendously by war. We know that the things that can help include having a, a strong and supportive family and a good network of supports around them. And so that's something that's really, really important. We can't recover lost childhood, but by providing a really, the structures for a really as, as close to a normal life as possible, it is possible to really help them uh, with, with emotional difficulties. Carl, we are seeing terrorist groups now using children more and more. They're either targeting children specifically, like we saw in the recent uh, Pakistan school shooting, or they are using children as suicide bombers, as executioners, as fighters. Uh, why children? Is it just for the shock value? Well, children are one of the most vulnerable sectors of society, and when they are experiencing conflict, an ongoing protracted conflict like the one in Syria, for example, they uh, tend to fall out of the normal safety net of the system. Uh, out of education, uh, a lot of them uh, end up having to work for their family, uh, so you see a lot of child labor. And uh, they are also uh, very easily influenced by when, whenever their parents are, are no longer around or, or they, they are concerned with a lot of other things that are affecting them uh, when the conflict is going on. So they are um, very easily manipulated and easy to, to recruit. Uh, it is a very worrying concern uh, inside Syria right now that recruitment of children, uh, we are seeing it on the rise. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it has a lot of repercussions, long-term repercussions, on uh, possibly an entire generation of Syrian children. Uh, not, not attending school is just one of them, uh, where you have uh, children who, are, who will be unable tomorrow, uh, when hopefully the, as soon as this, this conflict ends, uh, to, to return back to normal life and to continue with their studies. There is also the, the, the risks of, of, for example, early marriages that we are seeing also among refugees, for example. Uh, children, uh, refugees from Syria, uh, are uh, twice as prone to, to get married early uh, in, in their childhood as they, than they were before uh, with inside Syria before the conflict started. So these are all factors, and recruitment is one of them, uh, targeting vulner the vulnerability of children and somehow the availability when the, the rest of the, the social safety net around them collapses. Rachel, you've done work among the uh, refugees in the Syrian conflict. There's something like 200,000 people have been killed there, but millions more have been made homeless. They're refugees or they're internally displaced living in those camps. What did you encounter there? Mm. Well, one of my uh, PhD students, Ala al Khani, did some interviews in, on the Turkey-Syria border in camps and in communities there. And what parents were telling her was how much their children had changed when they had to flee uh, and then settling into camps and new settings. The children were showing all sorts of fears and anxieties. They were tremendously nervous and jumpy if a plane flew over or if a motorbike drove past, they would absolutely leap out of their skins. And parents had all sorts of really practical problems with young children, they might be very anxious, they might be wetting their beds at night, they might be having nightmares and crying out. All sorts of changes that the parents were noticing. But they were noticing very concerning changes in their children's behaviour. So they were really quite unsure what to do when their children started to play with, uh, wanting to play with guns, wanting to play at killing people, murdering people. Um, and so parents were having to deal, and care, people caring for children were having to deal with all sorts of changes in children. And they really felt very poorly equipped to do that. Uh, and largely because, as well, because parents themselves have been tremendously stressed by what they've been through and found that because they, they themselves were so upset, they were finding it very difficult to parent their own children um, 
in the ways that they would have done previously prior to the conflict. So the so uh, what was very clear to us was the need for very, very widespread information, advice, guidance and support for parents in raising their children. When I say parents, I mean caregivers generally, because a lot of children were having to live with aunts or uh, uncles or other friends and relations because of perhaps of having lost their parents. Carl, you spent a great deal of time in Gaza. In fact, I spent some time there as well. And I remember talking to the territory's only child psychiatrist at the time, a man called Dr. Iyad Saraj, who's quite well known, and he told me at the time that uh, this is an entire generation that will be traumatized. So, Carl, what was your experience there? What did you see there? Well, the tragedy in Gaza is that it is, uh, again, one of the long protracted conflicts which uh, never leaves, and uh, people like the late Dr. Saraj and, and the, the few psychiatrists there who work uh, all, day, all day long with, with children uh, tell you it's so even hard to speak of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, for example, because there is no post-trauma. The, the, the uh, conflict is there all the time in one form or another, b besides the huge escalations like we've seen last July and August, which left more than 530 uh, Palestinian children uh, dead and uh, up to 54,000 children homeless. Uh, they, they are living in a daily situation of conflict. Uh, children there whom I've met would, would, would distinguish between the different type of Israeli fighter jets flying above their heads and would tell you that's an F-16 or an F-17, F-18, whatever. Um, they, 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 are, they are living in this uh, kind of situation. It becomes their normality. And uh, the, yes, they end up then playing as, as uh, soldiers or, or uh, playing out uh, battle scenes in, in the streets among themselves, extremely worrying situation. But at the same time, these are also children who crave for their childhood. When you speak to them, they, they, they would love to have a normal football ground where they can play safely, where there, is, uh, there are no fighters just flying above them, where there are no gunshots heard or, or, or bombs falling or, or rockets being fired. They, they crave to have a, a playground in their neighborhood. They would love to be able to, to walk in, in a forest, uh, which is a luxury they do not have in, in the little uh, territory that is inside Gaza. This conflict has been going on for far too long, and uh, children are, are being uh, shaped by it, uh, even though uh, they crave for peace. Deep down, they, rem they, re they, they remain normal ch children with, with normal aspirations in a very abnormal situation. Rachel, we look at the situation right now where children are traumatized and the challenges that poses for their mental health. Uh, what happens to these children in the longer term when they become adults? Well, I th this I think is where the role of the family and the community and the environment is so important because these, um, we know that 60% of children will be showing really you know, marked post-traumatic stress symptoms of some kind. So this is, a, a, these are, as Carl was saying, these are generations of children who, whose mental health is put at risk um, by the experiences that they're continuing to have. And so finding ways of providing uh, help and assistance probably for these families and their communities because the, the, there's never possibly going to be enough mental health workers to be able to provide support. So actually putting in preventive support through providing information and guidance for families and for the communities that are caring for children for education is the only way really that we're going to avert the tremendous risks that there are for these children's mental health, their capacity to hope for the future, um, to raise their own families, um, we are, we are, this is an absolute tragedy for generations of children and for years to come. Rachel Calum, Carl Shembury, thanks to both of you for joining us. And that is all we have time for, but the conversation continues online. Join us on CCTV America's Facebook page to comment on this or any other show, or chat with us on Twitter at CCTV America. I'm Arnold Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching. We now leave you with some pictures of children in war zones around the world.